Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Happy Friday. Is it a pretty Friday where you are? It's a pretty Friday here. I have opened the chat, so feel free to get in there and comment. The, um, yeah, exactly. All right. Whew. I know. Good. And I'm so glad you all made it. And uh, we're all here. I, <laughs> I had trouble making it this morning. It took me, I was, I was, Tuning my harp, actually, and got uh, took a moment. So let's see. So Sonia's here from Florida, and Darlene's here. Hi, Darlene. We'll just give people a moment to check in because I was a little. Uh, I got in here at the last moment myself. Sarah's here from North Carolina. Hi, Sarah. And Stephanie's here. Excellent. Gosh, just talked to you, Stephanie, which is which is great, of course. And Will's here from Maryland, and Marilyn is. <laughs> here from Minnesota, and Marilyn from Virginia is here, and Carol from Virginia is here, and Debbie's here from Cambridge, Maryland, and Maryland is well represented here. Um, Trisha in Massachusetts, and Kay in Issaquah, and Pam in Illinois, a beautiful Friday in Illinois, she says, oh, excellent, good. Uh, Jane here in New York, Roberta, Massachusetts, oh, Massachusetts is, is hanging here, and uh, Debbie in Texas, and Liz from Ontario, and oh gosh, it's so great to see you all here. Excellent. Well, so we have Cheryl's here from Boise, Idaho. Wonderful. Um, let's start talking about this, um, this warm-up for today. Oh, but wait. Oh. <laughs> Darlene forgot to say where she was. She's in Smoketown, PA, which is not that far from where I am, and Linda in Michigan got a lot of M states happening today. It's, it's good. All right, let's get started with this warm-up, shall we? Now, remember, these are warm-ups with a focus. And so our focus is um, we're, we're working through some of the different focus areas that I use in kaleidoscope practice. You know something? I can probably get you some better sound. Is that a little bit better? Okay, good. <laughs> Cheryl says, glad my eye. Yeah, I'm very glad my eye is better too. So absolutely, thank you. Uh, and Susan's here from British Columbia. Excellent. Remember, if you want everybody else to see your comments, be sure that it's uh, that you use that box that says all panelists and attendees. It's that little drop down menu. And then everybody will see that you're here. Good. All right. So we're talking about the focus areas from kaleidoscope practice. And these are the, the things that I discovered were really important to knowing how to practice a piece so that you could finish it and make sure that you were practicing in a way that was going to get you the kind of results you were looking for. So last week we talked about practicing for detail and we did our warm up with some extra emphasis on detail. Detail I think is the easiest one of the focus areas because it's the one we use most often. It's the easiest one to focus on because we see it, right? We want to we can make those details right, those those fingering things and the notes and the rhythms and the we can follow the directions on the page all those kinds of details and they're easy or relatively easy to follow along with and today's focus area is also not that difficult but hopefully i'll give you some different ways to think about it and the second focus area is expression and you can think of a lot of expression stuff right now even in detail last week we talked about detail of expression but expression itself goes so goes so much further than just dynamics, and it talks. You know, there's dynamics, there are phrasing, uh, timing, different kinds of tempos, different kinds of articulation, different kinds of tone. There are lots of different elements to your musical expression, even the way you roll a chord. So. And today we're not looking at chords that we're going to roll, but today's warm up is all about chords. So let's get on with the warm up part of it, and then we'll talk about some of the expression stuff we can do. So my harp should be in tune because I did just finish with it. So it's close. It's a newish string, and it's been so humid that. Okay, a little bit better. All right, so let's just start by just warming up our fingers because I need it this morning. So just, I'm putting my fourth finger on middle C. We've done this before, right? These four, first uh, four notes, C, D, E, and F, and just some fourth fingers. Uh, clear my head a little bit, sitting straight, checking my posture, sitting back right on those sit bones, bringing the heart back, breathing, 
playing that fourth finger, closing it into my hand along with my pinky. All right. And now I'll do some third finger, making sure everything is staying relaxed. Nice and relaxed. Thinking about how my finger feels. Sometimes I like to look and see how my finger is working visually. Sometimes I just like to feel how it's working. Okay, some second finger, I'll put that in my hand, second finger. There we go. Make sure you're sitting straight onto the harp, right? Not, not all twisted. All right, put your other fingers back on and try some thumb. and then maybe just a one octave scale is what I'm gonna do. Nice and slowly, good cross under, closing everything, and back down. I think I'm gonna do another scale, you ready? We're gonna go up again, here we go, up. Gosh, I didn't dust the harp today. It's a little dusty. Oh well. I'll play the dust off it today. There we go. All right. How about if we warm up some left hand? Same idea. Octave below middle C. Just do some fourth finger. It's a little chilly down here this morning. Ugh, I can replace better than that. There we go. All right. Oh, whatever. Third figure, that's going to have to come along as we warm up. The callus on my fourth finger is so big. If I file it down a little bit, it'll be quieter. All right, some second finger. Close it all the way. Be sure your shoulder's not hunched, right? No shoulders up by the ears. Nice and relaxed. You're still sitting straight onto the harp. Put those fingers back on and let's do some thumbs. There we go. Your position to the harp shouldn't change no matter which hand you're doing. And how about that one octave scale? You ready? Here we go. In the C. Cross under. Replace. Close everything. Back down. And we'll do one more scale just for good measure. Because it's good for us. a pre-warm-up, isn't it? Back down. Okay, good. I'm not at D. Mm. All right. You ready for warm-up number nine? These are just simple little two note chords and we're not going to roll any of them. We're gonna play all of those notes exactly together. Um, what I like about this warm up is that it gives you a chance to test different finger combinations. And I didn't write the fingering in here on purpose so that while we were doing this warm up, you could think about whether you were supposed to play that size interval with one and two or one and three or one and four, right? Now seconds and thirds and fourths, like a second or a third or a fourth, are, are most often played with thumb and second finger. And then fifths and sixths would be with thumb and third finger. And sevenths and octaves would be with one and four. Now the, there, I realize that there are plenty of situations in which we, um, 
use a different fingering, but by training your fingers to use this most common, most characteristic fingering, you're helping them learn to size up those intervals without your thinking about it. So that if you're, if you see a third, one and two, go for it and they know how to reach it because that's their specialty. Seconds, thirds, and fourths. And then fifths and sixths, you know, you could be at the point and you probably are at this point if you've been playing a while where you could just put your hand in the air, boom, one and three, and have it be a fifth or a sixth. Boom, just like that. Similarly, one and four. An octave is probably a spacing that your hand knows because you do it with one and four so often, right? Like that. And of course, sevenths are a good one and four as well. But by training your fingers to play those same intervals with the same fingering most of the time, you get that kind of security in your technique and that dependability that you're really looking for. So that's what that's part of what this drill is all about. So we'll do just right hand, and you'll see that those first few measures, the first, that first four measures, actually use um, the same fingering: one and two, one and two, one and three. And then the last measure on that line, one and four, when we get to those octaves, same octaves again, the beginning of the second line, measure six and measure seven, and then some single notes, and then the last couple of measures, a one and three, one and two, one and two, one and two, one and three, one and three, and one and two. As I said, I didn't write the fingering in so that you would sort of, you know, have to think about it a little bit and be very conscious that you were making those fingering choices. Okay, let's get to it. So just right hand, nice and slowly, all the way through from the beginning. Okay, one, Ready, go. One, two, three, one, two, three. Close your fingers all the way. Three, one, two, three, and the octaves. One, close your fingers. Two, three, one, 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 two, three. Good. Let's do it one more time. Okay. From the beginning, right hand, same thing. Be sure you're sitting straight. I'm sitting a little crooked because I'm talking to you, but I'm going to straighten myself out for this time through. Okay. You ready? One, two, three. One, two, three. Switch your fingering between the intervals. Close your fingers. Be sure those notes are exactly together. Two, three, one, two, three. And now one and four here, right? Two, three. Close those fingers. One, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Good. Now we'll go back and we'll do the left hand. The same idea. Of course, left hand fingering is the same, right? So seconds, thirds, and fourths are best with one and two, or at least most characteristically played by one and two. Fifths and sixths by one and three. Sevenths and octaves and more with one and four. So the last interval your left hand plays is actually a tenth, isn't it? So nice big stretch. Oops, goodness, for one and four. It's just not in tune. Hmm, which note? is our culprit. Oh, it's the low C. Let me fix that because nobody should have to listen to an out of tune C. Hmm. I think the E's a little high. Good heavens. That's what happens in this humid weather. 
Oh, good. Nice. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. All right. Here we go. So we've got some fifths to start out in the left hand. A lot of fifths. Three measures worth of fifths. And then we have some fourths. So you'll switch to your second finger. Back to a sixth with your third finger. A second and a third. And then that sixth and a second and a third. So once again, you're switching your fingering between one and three and one and two. And that idea sort of continues. The last, then we've got a third measure from the end, a fifth, a fifth, a fourth. So that's one and two, one and two here, one and four for the seventh, one and four for the seventh, and one and four for the tenth. Um, it's, it's a lot of left hand intervals. The one interval that I didn't write in here for left hand is an octave. <laughs> left hand plays octaves all the time and hopefully you're good with those, but this one particular drill doesn't have any octaves. Who knew? Okay, I didn't notice it till after I'd written it. So here we go. Left hand from the beginning. Are you ready? One and three to start. <sighs> one, two, go. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, now switch your fingering to one and two. And now switch back and forth, one and three, one and two, or one and two, one and three, one and two, one and two, one and three, one and two, one and two, okay, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Three, good. Let's do that left hand right away again, okay? From the beginning again. Two, three. One, 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 oops, two, three. Now guess what we get to do? We get to put it hands together. So let's do that from the beginning. Remember that the challenge here also is that your hands aren't necessarily doing the same fingering, are they? So we'll go a little bit slower just to give you time to make sure that you're getting those different, uh, different fingerings, okay? One, two, three. One, two, three. Let's do that one more time, all right? From the beginning, and then I'll take your questions because I'll bet you have some. Okay, so from the beginning, here we go. Two and three and one, two. Three. 
pleasant little thing, isn't it? But I'll bet that um, you felt very busy as you were trying to get the right fingers to the right strings. Um, it's easy to sort of play through this and not pay attention to that. But when you start thinking about exactly what, what you want to have happen, that you want those particular finger groups on those strings, um, it can be a little bit more challenging. I know. So tell me, what, what did you think about that? Did you have fingering issues? Were you able to keep your fingering groups constant? Were you, um, did it relax you or stress you out? <laughs> While you're typing in comments so that I can, uh, can um, answer whatever questions you have about it, the next thing we're going to do with this, of course, we'll play it again naturally, but we're going to put that focus onto it. So that focus about expression, and I have a couple different ways, things that you'll be able to, ways that you'll be able to practice expression in whatever kind of warm up you do, uh, so that um, maybe in different kind of ways than you're thinking, certainly different ones than we dealt with last week. So as I'm looking, oh, wait, okay, there we go. Trisha says, fingering and brain working together is a challenge. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, when you're fingering your brain or working together, it feels really good, right? But it's, but it's a lot to, it's a lot to ask. <laughs> we do it all the time, but you know, it's like, oh man. So, but that's why I did not write the fingering in here. Because I don't, you know, fingering is one of those things too, right? You don't want to use, you don't want to be dependent on having fingering written in. You want your fingers to read the notes and understand what to do. So you don't want to play by the numbers or at least get stuck playing by the numbers. There are times we need fingering prompts in there, but it's nice not to have to have um, most of the fingering written in, right? Darlene says, I think this is easier to try to read ahead. Um, it ha Oh, you have a problem with that? Well, you know, yeah, <laughs> we all have problems reading ahead. Exactly. So, but you think this one's an easier way to try to read ahead? Okay, good. I like that. All right. Excellent. Um, Roberta says she was stressed, but will overcome. Okay. <laughs> Priscilla says, I, um, I was causing so much buzzing in the left hand. Well, um, there are a couple things, Couple, remember there are a couple kinds of buzzes, right? There's the buzz that comes from replacing really quickly after you've played. You're always gonna get a buzz with that. The later you replace, the less buzz you'll get. So that if you play, almost, if you delay your replacing till almost that second when you're gonna play, you will get less buzz that way. If I put my fingers on right away, it's going to buzz. The slower you replace your fingers, the more buzz you get, like, right? If you just put it on, the buzz is very short. But if you put it on slowly, you get a longer buzz. And then, of course, there's the buzz that comes from hitting other strings that are vibrating while you're trying to, like, with your fingernail ugly sound, isn't it? And that's just being very, very neat about your placing. So, but that's where buzzing issues come from, it comes from placing. So the more accurate you are with your placing, the less you will buzz. And the good news about that is that that kind of practice, practicing for accurate placing helps in everything that you play. It's one of the most important and most under-practiced skills for harpists. Let's see, Darlene's, uh, this is easier counting, she says. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, Kay says, trouble reading bass clef fast enough, need more practice. Sure. Okay. Well, you know, this is a great way to, to, to keep learning your bass clef and you'll just go slower. And remember to just, you know, hold your attention there on that bass clef and that will work. Okay. Let's see. Now, uh, it says, Jean raised a hand. What, um, if you can type in, this would be helpful for me. Priscilla says, I think with practice of this, it would get better. I'm panicked getting to all of the notes in the exercise still. Well, when you work on it on your own, you'll go at your own pace. You don't need to panic. I mean, if your pace is one, two, oh, I changed one of the notes, didn't I? Three, <laughs> there we go. You know, that's fine. And then you don't have to panic getting to the notes. So don't worry about that. 
you know, you could, you'll be fine with that, right? Okay, so let's go and let me show you a couple different ways to play with this um, that will help with expression. Feel free as we go through these. If I'm playing with both hands, that's me. You go ahead and play with one hand if that if that is easier for you at whatever speed I'm going, right? And that's the 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 you can use my speed to challenge you, but also don't use it to stress you out. That's no good. Uh, Jean says, "Oh, she just got in, so I hope you can do it some more." Well, we are we are doing it more. Okay, so here we are. We're going to go back to. Um, but remember, that's why we have replay recordings, right? You can always go back and do it with the replay too. All right, so here we are. We're gonna go back to the beginning. And of course, we're still keeping the fingering in mind and switching the fingering, but we're gonna practice for expression in a couple different ways. One of the, uh, the ways that we're gonna do this is we're gonna talk about articulation and the difference between legato, something that's very connected, and um, staccato or detached or accented where the notes sound more separate and more disconnected. So what we were kind of playing before, or at least what I, the way I was imagining it, was nice and legato where everything was very smooth and very connected, very seamless. And that's sort of what we're doing before. But this time, let's play it with some, um, I'll call it staccato. Staccato on the harp is kind of interesting because sometimes we actually make a staccato by cutting off the, 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 the note by muffling it right away. Um, you know, the harp is, is different from most instruments in that most instruments, you make the sound and then when you stop making the sound, the sound stops. For us, we make the sound and the sound continues until we do another motion to stop the sound, right? The sound goes on. We have to physically stop it. So where for most instruments, it's, you know, we play it and we stop. And so they're doing it just once. We play it and then we have to stop it. So um, it takes us extra time. So sometimes staccato involves muffling, which we could do there. I'm just making up notes now. But what I'd like to try instead is something is a different touch so that instead of our nice smooth legato touch that we were using before, this very sort of relaxed tone, what we're going to use is a more accented sound. And it's just, the way, the way I'm doing it is just putting more, um, uh, let's see, what could I say? I'm using sort of a harder, I'm visualizing using a harder part of my finger. My teacher used to refer it as playing more on the bone. Um, you know, like the bone inside your finger. It's like, you know, okay, I'm not playing with the fleshy part. Now I'm playing, playing hard, making my finger hard and then giving it a little bit faster attack so it has more of an accent. So this is a way to practice those accents. So let's go through the entire drill. We'll go nice and slowly, um, but if it's too fast for you, just drop out one hand, not a problem. And of course, nobody can hear you, right? So you do it the way that suits you, but we're gonna try doing a more accented sound this time. So from the beginning, all right, nice and accented. One, two, pretty slowly. Three, accent. Two, three, one, two, three. I'm also landing on the strings a little bit sooner for this. And one, and two. It doesn't it feel really different putting that um, that different kind of articulation to it? But think about that. It's, it's like a whole different tonal color, 
right? I mean, if your legato tone was in, in the, 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 the beautiful blues and greens and calm colors, this is like a, an orange or a yellow or a red. It's something that's bright, it's vibrant. And you might use it for something that's very March-like, right? This doesn't work like a march, but it could. Right? I mean, if that, it's not meant to be that kind of a piece necessarily, but it is a great way to practice that kind of articulation and making that difference between the legato. It doesn't have to be a dynamic thing. I know I just did that softer. It doesn't have to be a dynamic thing. It has to be an energy thing, right? Yeah. Oh, whatever the notes are. Okay, so let's do it again. And we'll try that, uh, that same thing with uh, that accented articulation. All right, here we go. Two, three. to close your fingers. Oh, wrong note, sorry. Keep accenting. Now, just to check and see how well you were accenting, switch back to a legato tone now. note accented. How? <laughs> using, to, using those differences in tone gives your music a whole range of, of expression that it won't have had without it. Excuse me. There we go. And uh, makes everything more interesting. And it's kind of fun to play with it in a pattern like this. So now let me see what I've got over here. Uh... Okay, so do you put more pressure on the strings to begin with? Well, sure, it happens at the, the accent happens at the point of attack. Okay, so it happens at that point of attack. And so that's where that's gonna come from. Remember the harp is one of the most tactile instruments that there are. So whatever is happening, it's gonna happen with your fingers. And since the accent always happens at the beginning of a note, if you picture, uh, say a, a flutist put accent in the note an accent doesn't happen through the note does it it happens right at the beginning bah. just kind of like the word pow pow so the uh, the the accent will happen at the beginning of the note so therefore it has to happen in that in that instant of attack that instant of of closing and so yeah it will involve more pressure oh i see Lori's asking about where to get the handout um, you know what? Uh, <laughs> um, I can't get that link for you right now. I think I could probably get it in a moment, but I can't, I can't, I don't know if I can get to that page right now to find that link. I guess if, if I always had the link in front of me, it would be helpful, but um, it might be, might be here. It's, it's on our replay page. So I'll, I'll find it for you in a moment, but right now I'm going to keep on going with this little exercise here. So, um, uh, Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lori, for being gracious about that. I just can't, can't get there right at the second. So let's do the, um, let's do this pattern again, but we're going to look at a different angle of expression. We're going to go back to dynamics since that's one that, uh, that, you know, we're sort of used to, but we're going to terrace the dynamics. So we're going to make the dynamics um, very intentional. And we're going to work at sort of expanding our dynamic range. So by terracing them, um, terrace is terrace dynamics are different from like a crescendo. In a crescendo, the 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 dynamic gets louder gradually, right, bit by bit across the crescendo. Oh, uh, oh, you know what? Nancy is here. Oh, there you go. In the chat, thank you so much, Nancy. I appreciate that. Lori, Nancy has posted in the chat. Um, where the, the link to the download is. Nice long link, but you can get the download there. Thank you so much, Nancy. I appreciate that. Okay, so, the, so in a crescendo, you've got that gradual getting louder, 
moment by moment. In the in terrace dynamics, you're at one level, and then you're at the next level, and then you're at the next level. There's no gradual distance from, you know, gradual change from one dynamic to the next, but rather there's a, a distinct difference from one level to the next. So what we're going to do right now is the simplest way to practice terracing dynamics. And we're going to do it this way. Every other measure, well, no, let me say it, I have to say it differently. We're going to alternate measures so that the first measure will be piano. The next measure will be forte. The next measure will be piano. The next measure will be forte. Now, this isn't necessarily the most subtle of terracing, but they're specific dynamics. So we're going to try that first, and then I have a more advanced version for you. But we're going to go through, and we're going to have piano, then forte, then piano, then forte, all the way through. Your job is to be sure that you change the dynamic for that very first chord of the next measure so that you're not sneaking into it, but that it's like the switch has flipped and you're making the dynamic different instantly. Okay? All right, so here we go, starting piano. All right, don't worry about accenting or legato. This, you know, piano forte is enough to worry about here. Okay, so ready? Two, three, piano. Two. Now forte. Now piano. Now forte. Now piano. Now forte. Now piano. Now forte. Interesting drill, right? Sometimes we're not used to thinking ahead enough to make that change in time. So that can be part of um, some expression training for you. It can also, it's also just an exercise in concentration, I think. So, and I'm going to give you one more level of difficulty in this exercise in concentration. And what we're going to do is terrace the dynamics over a wider range. So um, you can, we'll start this way, pianissimo, then piano, then mezzo piano, then mezzo forte, then forte, then mezzo forte, we'll go right back from there, then mezzo piano. Then piano, then pianissimo, and then what shall we do? Stay pianissimo all the way to the end, and then triple P right here, pianissimo, okay? So when we run out of dynamics, that's what we'll do. I don't want to go up to fortissimo because I don't think we need to play that loudly as part of this warm-up. So just every little stage, notice how gradual that that shift is right so instead of having just like piano to forte the on off switch we now have all these gradations in the middle pianissimo piano mezzo piano mezzo forte forte and you have to be really careful how you that you do differentiate them but that they're not so widely different that you have pianissimo and mezzo piano and piano and you've got no room between your piano and your forte so this is a wonderful way to practice your dynamic range and being very conscious of the differentiate differentiation blah, 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 the differentiation between those levels all right so let's give it a try I'll give you each dynamic as we go along remember you don't need to shift the dynamic during the measure just ter we're terracing going from measure to measure and we're starting pianissimo okay all right one two One, two, three, now piano. One, now 
Not much of a difference, huh? Mezzo piano. Mezzo forte. Forte. Mezzo forte. Mezzo piano. Pianissimo, all the way to the end here. And now, pianissimo, triple P right here. There you go. Now, if you are um, playing softly, remember to keep your fingers moving fully. Don't play softer by cheating your finger motion. Always close your fingers. Your touch is just lighter but your piano, your very soft dynamics will continue to have a tone if you still use full finger motion. Now I realize dynamics are really hard to hear over the internet. Um, you know, the internet sort of flattens those things out. So you may not be hearing those distinctions as much as you are doing them on your own, which is great. So, uh, you know, that we want you to be able to do them. Just remember that, you know, don't be frustrated listening to what's coming across the internet and thinking, I don't hear any difference or, um, you know, <laughs> so it doesn't always translate across the internet that well. Uh, so uh, don't, you know, don't worry if you don't hear it that way. We're, um, just be conscious, be aware that I am doing it, I promise. And, uh, and I know you can too. So questions about that? Those are a couple of different ways to practice working on points of your expression um, with a, a warm up like this. So oh, Mary's here from Florida. That's wonderful. Okay. Any questions about these? I think maybe we should play this through just one more time. Yeah. Uh, Nancy asked, is this in the kaleidoscope book? Yeah, sure. Um, there are plenty of drills in the in the in the um, in kaleidoscope practice suggestions about terrace dynamics and stuff, particularly, and of course in the Harpist playbook as well, which is right now only in PDF because I'm working on a new version of it. So this is fun. Oh well, good. That's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be fun. And just think of all the of all the the games, sort of, you know. They're games, they're musical games, but games you could play with this that will translate to actual, you know, real music that you're working on, right? Okay, let's go ahead and we'll play this one more time. And you can use whatever dynamic, whatever articulation you want. You can switch it up, do whatever you like. But what we're going to do right now, what I'm going to play is just a very nice mezzo forte kind of legato, kind of the way I did it in the beginning. So something very, very calm and, and sort of nondescript. I'm just going to be thinking about my, my technique and my placing and all that good stuff. That's what I'm going to work on. Let's see. Um, Lori says, it's wonderful to have this opportunity. Thank, oh, well, thank you for being here. I so appreciate it. And Roberta says, this definitely keeps practice very interesting. You know, Roberta, I think practice should be interesting. If your practice isn't interesting to you, you're not doing it right. And if you're not doing it right, it's not going to get you playing the music you want to play, right? So I think the, these things are so important. If we're not interested in our practice, life is sad, right? I mean, I, you know, I, you, many of you have heard parts of my, my own story before. I was not a good practicer. I was a terrible practicer as a kid. Horrible. And, um, you know, in some ways it served me in good stead. I learned you know, I, I became a very good sight reader uh, because I wouldn't practice. And so, <laughs> you know, there were, there were some advantages to this, but um, she says no more printed kaleidoscope. That's right. There's there, none of the kaleidoscope practice is in print. The book only has ever existed as an ebook. I mean, you can get it as a PDF or on Amazon Kindle that was never printed. And the, the playbooks are, are out of print. So until I get a second one done, they're out of print. PDF is the only option for those. Um, but uh, the, you know, the uh, practice, once I found out how to practice and could make it interesting for me, it was a whole different ball game. So practice is just totally, you know, it, it should be um, as much fun as playing. It should be interesting. It should be enjoyable. And it should, you know, 
um, not be boring and repetitive, right? Okay, so here we go. Oh, and what does Debbie say? Uh, she loves, oh, providing these sessions. Oh, you're welcome. Love your kaleidoscope materials too. Well, thank you. I'm glad you like them. Okay, so here we go. <sighs> okay, our warm up pattern number nine, one more time from the beginning, however you like. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. play that wrong note on you. Sorry, that was me. That wasn't you. <laughs> Played a wrong note. So, okay, good. Oh, look at this. I've got, Mary's saying she can't wait to practice. I love it. Okay, Darlene's working on practice skills. Excellent. Well, you know, practice skills, what should happen in your practice? What should happen is you learn to play your music, right? That's what you're working at. You're not working at getting all those, you know, it's not all about, you know, just focusing on the hard stuff. It's about learning to play your music. So the more playing you do in your practice, the, the, the more enjoyable it will probably be. And the easier it will be to do the difficult work that is required. So, okay, what does this say? Nancy says, oh, this is pretty, sounds beautiful. Exercise and joy. Well, you know, there you go. There's, there's joyful stuff in everything. So. I'm glad you were all here with me. This is wonderful. Let me, um, for those of you who are My Heart Mastery members, we've been talking about the kaleidoscope practice stuff today. Um, the, we're gonna be working with those a lot in our July theme because we're gonna be working on how those techniques work you through the, the three different learning stages, the first sight, the messy middle, and the finish stages. And we're gonna be working with the kaleidoscope techniques for that. So. For those of you who are My Heart Mastery members, we're gonna, we have more of this to come next month. But um, so our warm up pattern next week, we'll have a different one of the focus areas that we work on. It's a different PDF. Let me remind you, we've made, thanks to some comments and suge helpful suggestions from some of you, we've made a couple of, um, of little tweaks to our system with these warm ups, uh, so that the, uh, the, the, um, what was I going to say? <laughs> the link, you'll find us at the same link for these videos every time. So please, you know, you know how to find us now. You'll know where to find us next week. Uh, the replay page will have the PDF for next week as well. So you can get started on that and look at it ahead of time. Let me see. Lori says she's so excited because I'm just getting back to playing and have a lot of work to do. <laughs> oh, thanks to you. It'll be be guided and fun. Oh, well, you're very welcome. Okay. So, um, so we are, you know, so hopefully you'll be able to find us easily next week because we'll be right here and the PDF will be on that replay page. The replay link will go out as soon as this recording is ready and we'll get moving. Cheryl says she liked getting the warm up early. Yeah, we couldn't figure out how to do it for a while and then we did. So, so we were glad to be able to get that done for you. So the, and remember, we don't actually send the PDF, right? The PDF, well, I mean, we send it out with the reminder email, but we do um, have it posted on the replay page so that when you get to today's replay page, when it gets posted, this PDF will be up there and so will the PDF for next week. So, which is one I'm particularly fond of, as a matter of fact. So, okay, all right. I will look forward to seeing you all next week or whenever I see you again. And have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy getting out and about if you can. And I will see you all next week. Thank you so much for being here. All right, everybody. See you then. Bye.